Langmeyer. I know everyone here in the auditorium. And it's a good thing that I don't count on attendance here for any self-image. That would um, be very disappointing. So I will start. The first um, book I'm going to read from is called 50 Days of Solitude by Doris Grumbach. And it is reflections. It's her diary for 50 days when she left the city and went to be in the country, in a country house, and the recorded what she thought. And um, she tried very hard to not have many interactions. Um, that was one of the things she was trying to uh, keep, reduce in her life. Um, so these are the kinds of things that she thought about. Kenny Grindle once owned our house, perhaps 20 years ago. Now he lives in a tiny shack down and across the road from us. He has few amenities, no telephone, no television, no car, and no Facebook. He relies on neighbors for his occasional forays to the general store and on his radio for the news. He heats with a wood stove, so his strip of yard on the state road is strewn with logs, which he splits himself, and with odd bottles and miscellaneous objects, he offers to passers-by in a perpetual yard sale. Now and again, in a fit of assertive desire for isolation, he tacks up on his trees four cardboard signs that warn motorists to keep out. He is elderly, suffering from emphysema and the remnants of a hard life. Yet his opinions about what is important in life remain firm. Sometimes he and his clothes smell musty. I wonder if he believes that cleanliness has very little connection to godliness and that constant washing under the conditions he lives is too much trouble. He is adamant in his conviction that people are not to be trusted and are not necessary to him, that the news of the outside world from whatever source is tainted and false, and that the times of his youth in Sargentville were in every way superior to the present. He is more interested in who will be elected to be his selectman and game warden than he is his representatives in Washington or the president. The other day, I waved to Kenny when I drove to the post office, reluctant to break my silence by giving him a ride. I need not have worried. The next morning, it was the second day of a cold month, he gestured that he wanted a ride. I stopped for him, and he rode to the post office with me, saying nothing until he got out as his, at his house under one of the keep out signs. Social Security Day, he said, in his thick, almost incomprehensible Maine accent. Holding his letter of the month, he said goodbye and walked off, a great, slow bear of a man, man ambling into his cabin. When I got back to my place, the Captain White House, as it was still called before we moved in, I thought about Kenny. To the summer people of Sargentville, he is a, quote, character who speaks a strange tongue and looks very much alone and odd. They do not associate themselves with him because, of course, they lead their lives differently. But the more I thought about him, the more I realized that he and I are more alike than we are like our other neighbors. I, too, prefer my own society. I, too, have become distrustful of what I hear on TV, the radio, in the newspaper, and do not often listen to them or read it. We are alike in our critical views of the contemporary world and its inhabitants. We both keep better track of the small animals we live among than the human beings around us. 
It may be that we part company in our views of personal sanitation, but then it is easy for me, possessed of unlimited hot water, a washing machine and dryer, a shower and a tub to stay clean. Left to myself without those amenities, I think I would decide that living alone without a companion or much company, I did not need to worry about clean clothes or baths. Who knows, I might even put up some keep out signs to replace the discreet private one that now stands at the side of my driveway. The second one is, a, well, it's self-explanatory. The month and a half I spent alone was the time of the first days of the Clinton administration. But p politics played no part in my thinking. I had no newspaper delivered. The TV was down. My source of news was national public radio via a main station in Bangor to which I listened for 20 minutes at 6 o'clock in the morning and 20 in the late afternoon. I turned off all commentators on the air, and I talked to no one about the political situation by telephone. These self-imposed conditions may account for my conviction that what was going on out there in the world was inevitably unthinkable and that I ought to preserve my hard-achieved peace of mind by banning even the 40 minutes I had hitherto indulged in. I used to be certain that writers need to be au courant about everything that went on in the world of their time. This is probably good advice for the first 50 or 60 years they live. But later I decided I wanted to shield myself from as much of the terrible particulars of modern existence as possible to preserve my shrinking time for, well, let me say it, pompous as it sounds, contemplation of more important questions, of generalities ba based on a past I have stored away for review in the leisure of an elderly present. The horrifying details of life in the world today, of rape, war, AIDS, starvation, assassinations, murders, drugs, floods, hurricanes, torture, abuse of women and children, chicanery, oh, racism, drunkenness, madness, homelessness, political chicanery, could not be buried or wished away by an act of will, certainly. But they were held at arm's length for the short period I had devoted to the exploration of solitude. Without their constant presence, my mind appeared to be a long, low, insensate, featureless plain. It contained no peaks of drama and no deep troughs of despair. It had been leveled by the temporary absence of the world beyond my own integument. In that state, I felt somewhat barren, but still comfortable, an arboreal intellectual sloth who could think but not feel very much. I was not stirred by indignation or repelled by sanguinity. In violence, we forget who we are, Mary McCarthy wrote. Without the constant presence of violence in my consciousness, I knew who I was, and for short periods of time, that was enough. This, this next one, um, I think, is sort of humorous. And, um, and if you replace black flies with spiders, it um, is an interesting substitution. Anyway, I was not the only living creature in the house. A horde of large black flies had taken refuge around the window frames in the bedrooms. Prudently, they had come in from the cold 
to live as long as they could in a milder climate. I wondered what sustenance they found on the wooden glass of the southeast windows, but I understood their affinity for the radiating sun. As long as they did not come closer in search of greater warmth when I was reading in bed, I practiced my usual tolerance for living things and my dislike of killing them under any pretext. But one night, my lamp, my book, and I were attacked by an extended family of flying seekers after light and heat. My first instinct was to slap at them madly. So inept was I, I was wearing Sybil's Soviet mittens, that I missed them all and succeeded only in sending them back to their old berths in the window. I turned out the light so they would not be tempted to return, although I was not tired and wanted to continue reading. But I felt the truce that we had formed in the darkness, they in their place, I in mine, was preferable to mass slaughter. Eventually, pleased with my pacifism, I fell asleep. She has an interesting sense of humor. Okay, the next thing I'm going to read from is Michael Harrington's The Other America, Poverty in the United States. And this is a section that is called The Rejects. In New York City, some of my friends call 80 Warren Street the slave market. It is a big building in downtown Manhattan. Its corridors have the littered, trampled air of a courthouse. They are lined with employment agency offices. Some of these places list good paying and highly skilled jobs but many of them provide the workforce for the economic underworld in the big city. That is the dishwashers and day workers and fly-by-night jobs. Early every morning, there is a great press of human beings in 80 Warren Street. It is made up of Puerto Ricans and Negroes, alcoholics, drifters, and disturbed people. Some of them will pay a flat fee usually around 10% for a day's work. They pay 50 cents for a $5 job, and they are given the address of a luncheonette. It, if all goes well, they will make their wage. If not, they have a legal right to come back and get their half dollar. But many of them don't know that, for they are, they are people that are not familiar with laws and rights. But perhaps the most depressing time at 80 Warren Street is in the afternoon. The jobs have all been handed out, yet the people still mill around. Some of them sit on benches in the larger offices. There is no real point to their waiting, yet they have nothing else to do. For some, it is probably a point of pride to be there a feeling that they are somehow still looking for a job, even if they know that there is no chance to get one until early in the morning. Most of the people at 80 Warren Street were born poor. The alcoholics are an exception. They are incompetent as far as American society is concerned, lacking the education and the skills to get decent work. If they find steady employment, it will be in a sweatshop or a kitchen. In a Chicago factory, another group of people are working. A year or so ago, they were in a union shop making good wages with sick leave, pension rights, and vacations. Now they are making artificial Christmas trees at less than half the pay they had been receiving. They have no contract rights, and the foreman is absolute monarch. Permission is required if a 
worker wants to go to the bathroom. A few are fired every day for insubordination. These are people who have become poor. They possess skills, and they once moved upward with the rest of society. But now their jobs have been destroyed, and their skills have been rendered useless. In the process, they have been pushed down towards the poverty from whence they came. This particular group is Negro, and the chances of ever breaking through, of returning to the old conditions, are very slim. Yet their plight is not exclusively racial, for it is shared by all the semi-skilled and unskilled workers who are victims of technological unemployment in the mass production industries. They are involved in an interracial misery. These people are the rejects of the affluent society. They never had the right skills in the first place, or they lost them when the rest of the economy advanced. They are the ones who make up a huge portion of the culture of poverty in the cities of America. They are to be counted in the millions. Each big city in the United States has an economic underworld, and often enough the phrase is a literal description. It refers to the kitchens and furnace rooms that are under the city. It tells of the place where tens of thousands of hidden people labor at impossible wages. Like the underworld of crime, the economic underworld is out of sight, clandestine. The workers in the economic underworld are concentrated among the urban section of the more than 16 million Americans denied coverage by the minimum wage law of 1961. They are domestic workers, hotel employees, busboys, and dishwashers, and some of the people working in small retail stores. In the most recent government figures, for example, hotel workers average $47.44 a week. Laundry workers, $46.45 a week. General merchandise employees, $48.37, and workers in factories making work clothing, $45.58. This sector of the American economy has proved itself immune to progress. And one of the main reasons is that it is almost impossible to organize the workers of the economic underworld in their self-defense. They are at the mercy of unscrupulous employers and, in the case of hospital workers, management, management might well be a board composed of the best people of the city who, in pursuing a charitable bent, participate in a conspiracy to exploit the most helpless citizens. They are cheated by crooked unions. They are used by racketeers. In the late 50s, I talked to some hospital workers in Chicago. They were walking a picket line, seeking union recognition. They lost. Most of them made about $30 a week and were the main support of their families. The hospital deducted several, several dollars a week for food that they ate on the job. But then they had no choice in this matter. If they didn't take the food, they had to pay for it anyway. When the union came, it found the workforce at the point of desperation. A majority of them had signed up as soon as they had the chance. But like most of the workers in the economic underworld, these women were hard to keep organized. Their dues were minuscule, and in effect, they were being subsidized by the better paid workers in the union. Their skills were so low that supervisory personnel could take over many of their functions during a strike. It required an enormous effort to reach them and to help them, and in this case, it failed. An extreme instance of this institutional poverty took place in Atlanta, Georgia, among hospital workers in mid-1960. Men who worked the dishwashing machines received 68 cents an hour. Women kitchen helpers got 46 cents an hour, and the maids 55 cents an hour. If these people all put 
in the regular 2,000 hours of work a year, they would receive just over $1,000 for their services. The restaurants of the economic underworld are somewhat like the hospitals. The hidden help in the kitchen are an unstable group. They shift jobs rapidly. As a result, a union will sign up all the employees in a place, but before a union certification election can occur, half of those who are joined will have moved on to other work. This means that it is extremely expensive for the labor movement to try to organize these workers. They are dispersed in small groups, they cannot pay for themselves, and they require constant servicing, checking, and rechecking to be sure that the new workers are brought into the union structure. The fact that the economic underworld is so hard to organize makes it a perfect place for two types of racketeers to operate. Labor racketeers and their constant companions, the management racketeers. In the mid-50s, some of the locals of the Hotel and Restaurant Employees Union in Chicago were under racket domination. The crooks have since been cleaned out. The deal was very simple. The dishonest union man would demand a payoff as a percentage tax on the number of place settings in an establishment. In return for this money, the unionist would allow management to pay well below the prevailing union wage. This meant that waitresses were brought into the economic underworld along with the kitchen help. In New York City, a city that specializes in sweatshops, this crooked unionism was even more blatant. There are Puerto Ricans who are members of unions they never even heard of. Their rights in these labor organizations are confined to the payment of dues. The businessman who is so essential to racketeering unionism makes his payment to the union leader. In return, he gets immunity from organization and the right to pay starvation wages. The contracts that come out of these deals are black and white. All the standard provisions of an honest union contract providing for wage rates, fringe benefits, and the protection of working conditions in the shop are X'd out. The only agreement is that the place is unionized, which is to say that it is protected from honest unionism. Indeed, one of the paradoxical consequences of the AFL-CIO, quote, no raiding, unquote, agreement, is that it helps to keep some of these lowest paid workers in the grip of labor racketeers. As long as the racket local manages to keep a charter in a recognized international, and in the late 50s is becoming more difficult, but not impossible, then the honest unions are stopped from going in and decertifying the crooks. Many, many unionists who see the positive value in the no rating procedure have argued for an amendment. Rating will be permitted if an honest union can show that the local in a given situation is a racket outfit creating substandard conditions. Finally, the economic underworld is made up of small shops of hands full of workers, but that does not mean that its total population is insignificant. When the hotels, the restaurants, the hospitals, and the sweatshops are added up, one confronts a section of the economy that employs millions and millions of workers. In retailing alone, there are six million or seven million employees who are unorganized, and many of them are not covered by minimum wage. For instance, in 1961, the general merchandise stores, with an average weekly wage of $48, counted over 
1,250,000 employees. Those who made work clothes, averaging just about $45 a week, totaled some 300,000 citizens, most of them living in the other America of the poor. Thus, in a society of abundance and high standards of living, there is an economically backward sector which is incredibly capable of being ex exploited. It is unorganized and in many cases without the protect protection of federal law. It is in this area that the disabled, the retarded, and the minorities toil. In Los Angeles, they might be Mexican Americans. In the runaway shops of West Virginia or Pennsylvania, white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. All of them are poor, regardless of race, creed, or color. All of them are victims. In the spring of 1961, American society faced up to the problem of the economic underworld. It decided that it was not worth solving. Since these workers cannot organize to help themselves, their only real hope for aid must be directed toward the intervention of the federal government. After the election of President Kennedy, this issue was joined in terms of a minimum wage bill. The AFL-CIO proposed that minimum wage coverage should be extended to about 6,500,000 new workers. The administration proposed new coverage for a little better than 3 million workers. The conservatives of the Dixiecrat Republican Coalition wanted to hold the figure down to about a million. There was tremendous log rolling in Congress over the issue. In order to win support for the administration approach, concessions were made. Boy, this does not sound like it is from the 1960s. This is, could be in today's newspaper. And it is in today's newspaper, as a matter of fact. Um, it does not take much political acumen to guess which human beings were conceded. The poor, the laundry workers, there were over 300,000 of them, and according to the most recent Bureau of Labor Statistics figures, they averaged $47 a week. And the hospital workers were dropped from the extension of coverage. The papers announced that over 3 million new workers had been granted coverage, but they failed to note that a good number of them were already in well-paid industries and didn't need the help. In power politics, organized strength tells. So it was that America turned its back on the rejects in the economic underworld. As one reporter put it, we've got the people who make $26 a day safely covered. It is the people making $26 a week who are left out. Once again, there is the irony that the welfare state benefits least those who need help most. The men and women in the economic underworld were, for the most part, born poor. But there is another and perhaps more tragic type of industrial poverty, the experience of those who become poor. This is what is happening to them. On a cold evening in Chicago, winter is the most bitter enemy of the poor. I talked to a group of Negro workers. Until a short time before our meeting, they had worked in the meatpacking industry and were members of the Meatpacking Workers Union. They had been making around $2.25 an hour with fringe benefits and various guarantees for sick leave, vacation, and the like. More than that, they had found a certain dignity for themselves in that they belonged to one of the most integrated unions in the United States. The in industry had traditionally employed many Negroes. One factor was that much of the workforce was regarded, much of the work was regarded as dirty. That is, Negro tasks. 
A number of these people had found jobs in the plant making artificial Christmas trees. They received $1 an hour and no fringe benefits. The shop was, of course, non-union. Several workers were fired every day, and crowds gathered on Monday mornings to compete for their places. The $1 an hour was bad enough, but there was an even more important aspect to this impoverishment. When they worked at Armour, these employees knew a certain job security. They had rights in the shop because of the union. It was not only that their wages had been cut by more than half when the plant closed, it was also that they had been humiliated. This was particularly true of the blacks. As members of a minority group, they had been fortunate to get such good jobs and to belong to a union that took civil rights seriously. Now that they had been thrust into the economic underworld, that racial gain was wiped out. The Christmas tree shop hired blacks only. That was because they were available cheap. That was because they could be, quote, kept in their place. One of the workers I talked to was a woman in her 30s. When she spoke, the bitterness was not so much directed toward the low pay. What concerned her most was the, quote, slavery of her working conditions. She had to ask the supervised, supervisor's permission to go to the bathroom. At any moment, she could be fired for insubordination, and there was no grievance procedure or arbitration to protect her rights. She was vivacious and articulate, a born leader, so she tried to organize the, sh the shop. A majority of the workers had signed cards asking for a union election, but the National Labor Relations Board had postponed the date. The election will never take place. The Christmas tree season is over, and these people are now out on the streets again. Yet the workers in the sweatshop considered themselves lucky. They were making a dollar an hour, which was something. Two men I talked to were in different classification. They had passed the line of human obsolescence in this industrial society. They were over 40 years of age. They had been laid off at Armour in the summer of 1959. 18 months later, neither of them had found a steady job of any kind. When I come to the hiring window, one of them said, the man just looks at me. He doesn't even question, ask questions. He says, you're too old. Other men talked of how racial discrimination worked against them when the plan closed. One technique is simplicity itself. A job is rated by a plant well over its actual skill level. Training and educational qualifications are specified in great, great detail. When the white worker applies, these criteria are waived. When the Negro sh worker shows up in the hiring line, the letter of the law is enforced. Technically, there has been no discrimination. The black was turned down for lack of skill, not because of race. But that, of course, is the most obvious and palpable evasion. What happens to the man who goes 18 months without a steady job? The men told me, first, the luxuries go. The car, the house, everything has been, that has been purchased on installment, but not yet paid for. Then comes doubling up with relatives. And one of the persistent problems in becoming poor is that marriages are often wrecked in the process. Finally, and this is particularly true of the older worker, there is relief, formal admission into the other America. The armor workers who became poor were, to a considerable extent, black. In attitudes towards poverty, there is a curious double standard. America more or less expects blacks to be poor and is convinced that things are getting better, a point to be dealt with in a later chapter. There is no emotional shock when people hear of the experience of these human beings in Chicago. The mind and the feelings, even of goodwill individuals, are so suffused with an unconscious racism that misery is overlooked. 
But what happened at Armour is not primarily racial, even though the situation is compounded and intensified by the fact that blacks are involved. The same basic process is at work in Pennsylvania and in Detroit. In a brilliant report, Harvey Swatos wrote of his first impression of St. Michael, Pennsylvania. It is a strange thing to come to town and find it full of grown men. They stroll the narrow, shabby streets, chat at the corners, lean against the peeling pillars of the town saloon, the St. Michael Hotel and Restaurant, and they look more like movie actors than real human beings because something is wrong. That something happened on April 24, 1958, when Maryland Shaft Number 1 closed down. Since then, some of the miners have been able to get jobs elsewhere, but for most of them, there are idleness and a profound change in the way of life. What, after all, do you do with a man who is a skilled coal miner? When the mine closes down, what industry do you put him into? He is physically strong. He has lived his life in a tight community of coal miners. He has intense loyalties to his fellow workers and to his little town in the mountains. But he has a skill that is hardly transferable. Some of the men from Maryland Shaft One got jobs in the steel industry, but they have already been hit, hit by layoffs there. The automation process that destroyed the work in coal is spread, spreading to steel. Their problem is following after them. Others are working for a fraction of their previous wage as orderlies in hospitals and institutions, as janitors and stockmen in big stores. But again, the most humiliating part of this experience maims the spirits. As Swatos put it, it is truly ironic that a substantial portion of these men who pride themselves on their ability to live with danger, to work hard, fight hard, drink hard, love hard, are now learning housework and taking over the woman's role in the family. For the miners have always been an almost legendary section of the workforce. Their towns are as isolated as ships and they have had the pride and metier of seamen. Their union battles were long and bloody, sometimes approaching the dimensions of civil war, as in the fabled Harlan County struggles. They had a tough life, but part of the compensation was the knowledge that they were equal to it. Now the job has been taken away and the pride with it. In many of these mining areas, there are small garment shops that are running away from union labor in New York and other establishment centers. Their pay is miserable, and they look for the wives of the unemployed. That's the garment workers. So the miners do the housework and hang around the saloon, and the wife has become the breadwinner. In Detroit, one can still see still another part of this process. It is not minority poverty, as with the armor workers, nor is it depressed area poverty, as in the case of the coal miners. It is the slide backward, the becoming poor, that takes place in the midst of a huge American industrial city. In 1956, Packard closed out a Detroit factory and destroyed some 4,000 jobs. What happened to the men and women involved has been carefully described in a special study of the Senate Committee on Unemployment Problems. The report is entitled, Too Old to Work, Too Young to Retire. When the Packard plant closed, the world fell in on some of the men. There were those who cried. They had worked in the shop for years, and they had developed a personal identification with the car they built. Some of them were particularly bitter because they felt the company had blundered by lowering standards and turning out an inferior product. 
They were laid off in 1956, but many of them had still not found regular work when the recession hit in 1958 and again in 1960. The workers in the best position were those who were both young and skilled. Their unemployment averaged only a little better than five and a half months. The young, young and semi-skilled were out on the street for an average of seven and a half months. The old skilled workers for eight and a half months and the old semi-skilled workers, for instance, machine operators over 45, averaged better than a year of unemployment. The old and unskilled were out for 14 months. For almost every one of these human beings, there was a horrible sinking experience. Of those who were able to find jobs, almost 40% took a position inferior to the one they had held. Skilled workers took semi-skilled or even common labor, laborer jobs. Most of these did not become poor. They were humility and downgraded, but not dragged below the subsistence level. But some of the old, the unskilled, and blacks entered the other Americas in the late 50s. They came from a well-organized and relatively high-paying industry. They ended by becoming impoverished. So it was in Detroit, Michigan, and the story is substantially the same as in St. Michael, Pennsylvania, or Chicago, Illinois. In the 50s and early 60s, a society with an enormous technology and the ability to provide a standard of living for every citizen saw millions of people move back. Some of them retrogressed all the way and ended where they had been before the gains of the welfare state were made. Many of them slid back but did not become impoverished. So in the next section, um, he talks about the psychological components that were involved. And um, it's sort of depressing that we haven't come very far. Uh, and so the rest of the stuff I'm going to read is more uplifting. This, I'm reading from T.S. Eliot's Old Possum's Book of Practical Cats. And this is a book on which the show Cats was based. And uh, I'm not going to sing the, the uh, poems, but you probably, you might recognize some of them. My goodness, I really one poem. Okay, I the naming of cats. The naming of cats is a difficult matter. It isn't just one of your holiday games. You may think at first I'm as mad as a hatter when I tell you a cat must have three different names. First of all, there's the name that the family used daily, such as Peter, Augustus, Alonzo, or James, such as Victor or Jonathan, George or Bill Bailey, all of them sensible, everyday names. There are fancier names if you think they sound sweeter, some for the gentlemen, some for the dames, such as Plato, Admetus, Electra, Demeter, but all of them sensible everyday names. But I tell you, a cat needs a name that's particular, a name that's peculiar and more dignified, else how can he keep up his tail perpendicular or spread out his whiskers or cherish his pride? Of names of this kind, I can give you a quorum, such as Mongoose Strap, Quaxo, or Coracopat, 
such as Bum Ballerina or else Jelly Lorem, names that never belong to more than one cat. But above and beyond, there's still one name left over, and that is the name that you never will guess. The name that no human research can discover, but the cat himself knows and will never confess. When you notice a cat in profound meditation, the reason, I tell you, is always the same. His mind is engaged in a rapt contemplation of the thought of the thought of the thought of his name, his ineffable, effable, ineffable, deep and inscrutable, singular name. The end.